Okay, we're going to start for the thousands here and out there and for Leslie and Olivia who are here. And this is being recorded. So I'm not surprised at having a small group and uh, many others will get to watch and listen. So I'll read some opening words from Reverend Mark Morrison-Reed, who was a president of the CUC during the time I was executive director. The task of the religious community. The central task of the religious community is to unveil the bonds that bind us all. There is a connectedness, a relationship discovered amid the particulars of our own lives and the lives of others. Once felt, it inspires us to act for justice. It is the church that assures us that we are not struggling for justice on our own, but as members of a larger community. The religious community is essential. For alone, our vision is too narrow to see all that must be seen, and our strength too limited to do all that must be done. Together, our vision widens and our strength is renewed. So um, recently, uh, the, uh, CUC, the UCV board uh, discussed how we go about appointing delegates to our national association. And up until uh, now, what we've done is appoint delegates for a particular meeting by the board. People can apply and there's often a call out by um, the board or other people involved in denominational affairs. And uh, from that, we the board selects people in the, um, yeah. And so uh, we wanted to look at some of our processes and that's one that we started examining more closely and found that there were CUC recommended guidelines. And their guidelines have us do that in a kind of a longer term, more methodical um, way. And <clears throat> what they recommend is that congregations appoint people for a two year period. So they would wind up attending at least two uh, general meetings, two annual general meetings. In the past year, there was an additional special meeting. So if we had been using that process at that time, uh, somebody would have attended three meetings. And then a key thing is that in between, they connect with that wider community that Mark Morrison Reed talks about. So they hopefully get more involved in the CUC and the programs they offer and get a better, uh, a, a broader view of who we are across Canada. And so we adopted that at, our, at the end of January by email and then uh, ratified it at our February 15th meeting. Um, and if Kirsten was here, I would pass it along to her, but she's not. So Olivia, would you come up and talk as um, uh, four people are lined up to talk about their experience of being a delegate in the past and given that, you know, that uh, this new process will build on that experience. have to take off my double masks. Um, so I know there aren't many people here right now, but uh, Mary and the board asked me to speak as somebody who's been a delegate uh, a number of times before, and I've got a few minutes, so I will do that. Um, I was a delegate, I've been a delegate uh, at every CUC meeting for the past six years, um, which sounds like a lot, but I think it's important to note that I volunteered for the first one, like as soon as I turned 19, and Stephen knew I was keen for that kind of stuff, so I volunteered for that, and I volunteered, uh, I enthusiastically volunteered for uh, this past special meeting in November, but those were the only ones that I actually put my name in for on purpose. All of the other ones were because I was on a short list that Stephen gave to board presidents of people who had done this kind of thing before and um, were okay with being called on to do it again. And I always said, I'll do it if there's nobody else who wants to and there never was anyone else who wanted to. So I did it every time. Um, I think that, uh, I think that's like how I'm framing this because in my mind, being a CUC delegate is the same as any other kind of volunteer work here. We are one of the largest congregations in Canada. We, whether we realize it or not, we're a big mover in Canadian Unitarianism. So I think it's important that we see 
our congregation engaging with the CUC and engaging with other smaller congregations across the country, um, I think it's important that we see that as volunteer work. Uh, the same as we see raking leaves and um, facilitating programs and all those other kinds of things um, that we all do. Uh, so I happen to be uh, one of those people who doesn't die of boredom from meetings. I don't mind them. I have a lot of issues with how the CUC runs our meetings, but I'm not original in that. <laughs> They're the same as everybody else. And I found that it is just as rewarding as any other kind of volunteer work. You know, when I do volunteer work to help clean out a crawl space here, I'm having a day of hard work, but also it's kind of fun to hang out with other Unitarians all day, even if you're vacuuming mouse poop in the basement. Um, and I think that I've had very similar experiences at uh, CUC AGMs. Um, it just broadens it. So uh, that's kind of what I wanted to say to respond to the questions that the board had prompted, that for me, this is the same as any other kind of volunteer work. It's just one where sometimes the church pays for flights. And I like that part. <laughs> um, yeah, so if you're a person who enjoys meetings, enjoys being a committee head of, or not even a head, but enjoys committee work in any of our many committees, it's very similar work. And it's work that we kind of have to do as a, a major congregation here. Um, and Mary, would you like me to ask for questions now? Or just, yeah. but, okay, yeah, there'll be questions for everybody at once. That makes sense. All right. So I'll invite Galen to talk over Zoom. He also has been a, a delegate for a number of um, at least six, I think, meetings. Yeah, thanks, Mary. Um, I think the first UC, uh, CUC AGM that I recall attending was uh, in Ottawa in 2012. Um, and then I've been to a number of AGMs since then, most of them virtually. The, the, my experience of the process, I think, was pretty similar to Olivia. Um, you know, I would hear that there was an AGM coming up. I might think I could do that or that would be a way to help out, but then I wouldn't really follow up. And then I'd get a call, uh, often from Keith Wilkinson, um, asking me if I'd like to volunteer. And I'd say, sure. And then um, there'd be a, a process. Um, the CUC is usually pretty good about sort of putting together their agenda and everything well ahead of time. So we would usually meet in the fireside room and discuss um, the issues that were coming up. Um, I, I do think attending an AGM and participating in an AGM is an important way of living our Unitarian values. Um, especially our, um, our fifth principle um, about the democratic process. There's, it's an interesting experience. There's, I, know, I recall frequently having this feeling, um, you're sitting in a room full of a lot of people. Um, you're looking at a piece of policy that's maybe been crafted by a task force. They put a lot of work into it. Maybe there's some sort of subtle or complicated nuance, it has to do with accounting or something, and you're not entirely sure that you understand everything, but, you've, but you're there and you're paying attention and you're bringing your own perspective to it. And somehow in that process of having all of these people, hopefully with all slightly different backgrounds and different perspectives and different areas of knowledge and expertise, and you're all kind of looking at this thing and paying attention to it, you get this result. Um, that's sort of greater than the sum of its parts. I think that's kind of what's so great and important about democracy. It's like this, this kind of collective conscious process examining um, all these issues together. So I really, I really like being a part of that. I really appreciated participating in that. Um, but I do think it's a good idea to look at the our process around how we get people involved because it has been a little bit haphazard maybe up till this point. Um, so yeah, I think that's all I'll say for now, thanks.
Thanks, Galen. Kirsten, do you want to come up and do your piece now? If, uh, if you're not here, you might not know that there's a huge celebration happening outside, so. Hello, folks. Uh, so my name's Kirsten Moore, and today um, I'm just here to talk to you because I'm currently uh, one of two representatives on the board of directors for the CUC, um, representatives from the BC region. So there are, do we talk about how many regions there are? So there are four regions. There's BC is its own region, and then Western, Central, and Eastern. And there's two representatives from each region, and usually um, the BC representatives are, we're kind of concentrated in the, the southwest lower mainland and the islands area. Um, so Michael Scales from Beacon is the other representative. And um, let's see, what else? So the next uh, annual general meeting that's coming up is on May 14th. And there's not, I think because of the special meeting in November where we uh, voted on the eighth principle, nobody put in a resolution. Um, so there, there are no special resolutions coming uh, to this meeting. So it's, we have to approve the, the, the budget in principle because it's a May meeting, but the budget year is January through December. We approve two budgets. So it'll be approving the updated budget for 2022 and the projected budget for 2023. And then there will be a, Michael Scales is finishing his three-year term and not renewing. So there's an open position um, and there's open positions on the nominating committee. So those elections will happen. And, and that is about it for voting. But there is gonna be some more information because there's the board has put together um, a decision-making task force, I think you're coming up with a better name, but to look at um, the whole processes of processes of democracy. Uh, and they just started meeting um, last month. And there's also, we're also starting a bylaw review. So there'll be, there's be a lot of updates on the meeting about what's going on with the CUC and what the staff are doing. Um, the, the new, um, we also approve the, the priorities and goals for the year. And, um, and so right now actually is the feedback process. So as a delegate or as a congregation, uh, looking at what those expected um, priorities and goals are, now is the time to give feedback on those. And then the, um, the final uh, draft goes out in April for everybody. Um, so that's kind of the business that's coming up this year. There will be a plenary, so that's a time to uh, have a small meeting, like a smaller, more informal meeting with the board, usually a couple days, a couple evenings before the AGM, to actually ask questions and do more in-depth talking about what's coming up in the meeting um, as, as a way to make the meeting be able to happen in two and a half hours, kind of get the questions uh, done in a, in a more informal way of, of talking together. And then it's not a conference year, uh, but there will be a broadcasted um, national service on the 15th of May. And the staff is talking about creating some kind of Friday night uh, social, online social gathering, um, also informal just to get people into that spirit of connecting across the country because you don't really get to interact with anybody else during the AGM. And we can, for, C for UCV delegates to the AGM, we can set up in here like this or in the fireside room, which is a little bit, since there's only six people, probably the fireside room, uh, and join um, for, um, in that and join the meeting together. So you'd actually be able to be together. Although I'm not entirely sure how voting is going on, whether you need your own login device to register votes. So, but that information will be coming out. And are there any questions? And since there is an open, I mean, the, there's a forum next 
Saturday with the nominating committee and myself and Michael Scales. If anybody is interested in being a representative for British Columbia on the CUC board, since that is open, there will be a, a be uh, I can't remember if it's at 9 or 10 o'clock in the morning next Saturday. Um, but that information is available somewhere and I can get it out to you. <laughs> I know what's happening. Um, and, that's a, and then that's a chance to just uh, talk a little bit more about what it means to be a representative. But we have that position open. And just because I'm on the board doesn't mean it can't be another UCB member. That's happened in the past. But it, they, it's, it's really about looking at that national the national scope. So, yeah. I actually do have a question. Can I just talk into this? Yeah. Okay. Can you hear me? Yeah. Oh, okay. So, I'm not sure this is an appropriate question because my question is more about the decision making process. Mm -hmm. So, at, at the AGM meetings. Is, does, does that fit in with the mandate? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. I came a bit late, so I wasn't sure. So what I'm not clear on is if there's an agenda item that's being discuss, discussed at the AGM, do the, do the delegates, like the UCV delegates, do they receive, obviously they receive the agenda items a certain amount of time beforehand, but do they have enough time to check with UCV members about the opinion of UCV members on, on each and every agenda item? Um, the agenda, the packet, the AGM packet has to come out 30 days before the meeting. Okay. So it would be within those 30 days. And, but, so then any, but the resolutions right now, the, the budget is out, um, the goals and priorities, like everything that's going to be voted on is out now for feedback. So if there's any, um, if, if we want, we could and probably should, we usually do organize a meeting around this time to look at what those, what's going to be voted on to give uh, congregational feedback before it gets finalized. Because then at the AGM, there's only non-substantive amendments or a yes-no vote. Okay. So that could be done and should be done. Do you think it will be done? <laughs> Well, that would be a question for, do we have a liaison? We don't have a liaison right now. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. It is a good idea. And Keith Wilkinson has organized that in the past, and we don't have anybody in that position right now. Uh -huh. So willing volunteers <laughs> for it to be a liaison. <laughs> this is a test. Mary was saying that this, this, this setup is a test for connecting folks from home to the sanctuary via Zoom and being able to interact. So, yeah. Uh, any other questions? Thank you all. Oh, yep. Actually, I just want to be clear. Uh, you're on the board of CUC. Mm -hmm. And but the delegates that we want we want to solicit uh, nominations for are the church. Correct. Delegates? Yes. Okay. Yeah, I should not be a delegate representing um, UCV at the meeting. Yeah. We kind of we cleared that up among the board members last year because lots of times there there was overlap. Um, but because we're um, the board of the CUC speaks with one voice. Uh, it, 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 I wouldn't be able to be up there and vote against the resolutions that I put forward as a board member. So, um, so, so yes, so I'm on the CUC board, the national board, and then this meeting is a meeting of all the member congregations, delegates from all the member congregations. And UCV has allowed six delegates, it's all based on size. And so the UCV delegates get to go and, and have that democratic voice to the, the national scope of work. Thank you. Mm -hmm. We have a question on Zoom from Keith Wilkinson. Oh, great. Um, I just wanted to ask if we could uh, have the people identified who have just spoken. I heard their voices. I didn't see their faces or names. Could, who, who would God in the sanctuary? 
All right, we had Sheila Rossells speaking first and Ingrid, oh. Ingrid right? Ingrid, Ingrid Loiters. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thanks. So that's a, a note. <laughs> We're speaking from the floor to say our name. Right. Uh, there's also a question from Leslie Kemp. Ah, yes, Leslie. Okay, um, well, I'm, I don't know, like in the agenda, I've been asked to speak, so I've got some, so I don't know when that is. I didn't hear. Um, so I, I just want to say I'm here on Zoom, in case you didn't know. I see you in the sanctuary. We've got a big screen here with the four people that are on Zoom. So Leslie, why don't you go ahead now and speak about your experience? <laughs> Okay, yeah, I, I just said that because I wasn't sure if you actually knew I was here. <laughs> yeah, we see you and hear you. Okay. Okay, um, so I'm Leslie Kemp, and I have um, had various positions throughout the years at UCV, including on the board for a number of years as president, past president, or vice president, actually, not in that order. <laughs> Um, and I also have been a longtime member of the Social Justice Committee. So I have been a delegate a number of years. I have not counted, but I suspect at least six or seven or maybe more times. And uh, although I haven't been for the last mm, two or three years. And I don't, I think I might have been a delegate one year when it was online. Um, but most of those times were at in-person meetings. And I was also on the board uh, the, before Kirsten Keith was in the position um, or was a, was a board member. And I was on the CUC board for five years in that capacity. I also served as a social responsibility liaison. And I worked with a team that uh, worked for, I think, at least a year on changing the whole CUC resolution process. It was very involved. Uh, we uh, made the study period shorter, at least an option for a one-year study period. Could go longer. Uh, that, that's the recommendation in the CUC resolution process that all resolutions be studied by congregations for a period of at least one year. Although there is a process for emergency resolutions on things that come up, uh, let's say, um, you know, some event that we feel that we need to respond to. The other aspect of the resolution process was trying to encourage more actions on resolutions. There tended to be a lot of activity in congregations leading up to a resolution, especially something that was controversial. And then afterwards, you know, people say, oh, the resolution has passed. And then um, not as much action or follow through. So those are the key things that um, we, we did in, in the resolution process. But um, that being said, the period leading up to the resolution is, is one of the most valuable. There's heightened interest on the issue and an opportunity to engage with the congregation uh, you know, on the resolution in a very fulsome way. And in my view, this is really important part of the process it, and is critical for an informed discussion and debate on the issue at hand. And it also, um, you know, is uh, in keeping with that principle um, on the democratic process, the right of conscience and the use of the democratic process within our congregations and in society at large. So I want to give one example that I thought was a really useful one. In 2003, there was a resolution called Alternatives to Drug Prohibition and where we called for the decriminalization of, of drugs and the regulation of drugs. And so that was, as is now, you know, that's a topic that's still very relevant as the number of opioid deaths has gone through the roof. Um, but what um, 
what we did in UCB is we had a lot of education. We had forums on the issue. We had discussion and structured discussion and debate. We actually brought the wording of the resolution forward to UCB members and we had um, a special meeting just to debate it among ourselves. And we, we've done that with other resolutions as well. And I think it was very useful because we um, voted on that resolution. Um, some members came forward who had a lot of expertise and you know, made very concrete suggestions to how we could reword it to make it more uh, useful. And then all the delegates um, could go to the CUC AGM with an informed perspective and a solid understanding also of where the congregation was at. And in this case, it was very supportive. So I think that's important. Um, is it's not just up to the delegates, I think. It's up to the congregation to, to have a process in place where all members can engage. And I think that's really an important part of that democratic process as I read it. It's not just the democratic process that occurs when you get to the CUC meeting, it's what happens within congregations themselves. Um, anyway, that's how I understand that, res uh, that principle. And um, so, but as a delegate, you know, it's important, you know, to read fully everything that's coming forward. There's quite a lot of uh, information to discuss it with people, to clarify. And um, as Galen mentioned, uh, in later years, when we didn't always have that AGM or a special meeting, we did have briefing meetings of delegates. And I remember going to some of those. And so we would discuss them informally. I mean, I actually favor doing that, the process I described where possible, especially um, something that is controversial or not, a, you know, it's an opportunity to educate people. And um, so I'll stop there, I think. Oh, I just wanted to say the CUC meetings in person they are, um, it's a, and somebody mentioned the, I think Kirsten mentioned the, uh, there is outside of the formal AGM, there has been a plenary or a meeting to discuss the resolutions in an informal way. And that's very valuable also. And I think they've done that quite well. So um, the people from across Canada, from different congregations come together and they share their understanding and it really helps uh, the discussion, which is a lot more formal. Uh, and, you know, um, following different rules of order, whatever they are. <laughs> so, yeah, I'll stop there. Okay, thanks very much, Leslie. And uh, Lynn Armstrong is the next delegate that we've lined up, who also has a current CUC role. Is it possible to ask a question of um, after, Lynn, after, Lynn speaks, okay. we'll have questions. after Lynn speaks, we'll have questions for all of the delegates. Right. Okay. Um, yeah, so I, I got really involved in a, my first Unitarian congregation in the 90s in the Comox Valley. Um, and I just, I became really curious about, you know, the wider denomination. I became really curious about how, how things were structured and how things worked um, and started attending, you know, annual meetings, um, often as a delegate and, um, and, and especially the conferences. So the whole, I mean, the excitement of meeting and getting to know people from other congregations across Canada, I found really interesting and rewarding, and um, and part and so I'm here to give you a pitch, you know, for taking a turn as a delegate. Um, things have certainly been different, you know, the last couple of years, the last few years, um, you know, with COVID, and then before that, we'd already started going to um, not having a conference every year, but alternate years. 
in the uh, in my online experience, we still get broken out into breakout rooms where you end up talking and meeting, you talking with and meeting people from other congregations across Canada, and I love it. I just find it really interesting. Um, and I've got one one point I want to make is that we often hear, we often talk about the CUC as though it's um, them. You know, here, here we are in our congregation, UCV, um, and we send money to them. We send, you know, around $30,000 or, so, or so a year. Um, and that it's not us and them, <laughs> that, that we are, um, uh, you know, we're member congregations of the Canadian Unitarian Council where, where it is us, we elect the, um, you know, the board of directors, but it's not the same as having a, um, a higher authority that's giving direction, you know, to, to our congregations. We are all in this together. So well, that's my main Great. point. Do you want to have yeah, but, any questions? Yeah, why don't you or? stay there and we'll see if there's any questions for any of the delegates. Okay. You hear me? Yes. Okay. So it's Sheila again. Um, I, I was just curious, Leslie, when you mentioned that there was a plenary session that takes place before the AGM, how much time prior to the AGM does that take place? The plenary is usually the night before, right? When it's yeah. there. Yeah. Okay. Did you want to say something, Leslie, or you? No, I was going to yep. say the same thing, so she beat me yeah, to it. That's usually, okay. Okay, it's thank the you. the night before, so people are prepared for it. Um, but, but what we've done here, you know, is ha mm -hmm. regularly had um, forums or places where we could all get together and talk about what was coming up, educating the congregation. And then there's a lot of information for delegates, you know, in advance, online and by email. And then the plenary is the chance to actually talk together. Okay, thank you. Yeah. No questions on Zoom? Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, I have one question. It's Marg Fletcher. Um, I was a, a delegate uh, once when I was um, um, president here at, at UCV and um, I don't remember anything controversial at the time, so um, I don't even know if I asked what the rules are on this, but it just came to me following on um, Sheila's first question about um, uh, time for people to be, if you're a delegate, to be aware of issues ahead of time, and Leslie's, I think, really important comments about having a year to really, where it's possible, where it's not more timely, that you have to make decisions more quickly, that people can delve into it, but I think, what would be would feel important to me if I were to be a delegate again, and I imagine to all of us, is um, let's assume that there was an issue that came up and um, we were very aware of what our congregation, you know, if we were gonna vote, our majority felt on that issue. What is the role of the delegates who go? Do they vote their own conscience or do they vote by what the congregation has said? Um, that they're there representing, because I think that could be, I haven't been in that situation of wanting to vote maybe differently than what my congregation thought, but I think it's important for people to be thinking about that. You know, if we send six people and our congregation was, you know, 60% in favor, do four of us need to vote for it and two of us against it to really represent, you know, I just think that that would be something. I, I think I can respond to that. Great. <laughs> I, I, I think how it's happened in the past is that the board has directed the delegates as to, or has informed the delegates of comments they've heard from the congregation, and at least in the last couple of meetings have said that you're now informed, but go out there and vote as you see fit. But that's, that doesn't have to be the way it's done. In November, for instance, uh, Beacon, a much smaller congregation, had two delegates, and one of their delegates stood up and said, our congregation is united in wanting to fight, fight racism, but we're divided on whether to vote for this principle. 
And so they had decided in advance of a congregational meeting if the split was um, any more than 40, 60 percent, they would have one delegate vote yes and one delegate vote no. So that's up to the board to decide how to direct delegates or not. It's Sheila again. So that seems odd to me. Um, so in other words, what you're saying is that there could be a situation where you find out that the members are 70 or 80 percent um, have one point of view. And then the board says to the delegates, okay, we're informing you that the membership, it's 80 percent of the membership wants point of view A, but you can disregard that and just and, and vote according to your to your personal preference and ignore an 80 percent preference of of the membership like that just doesn't seem democratic to me well well one hopes that under the right of conscience part of that those delegates conscience would be i've heard what our congregation says but are there no written guidelines about this no don't believe so she, kirsten's shaking her head she's on the board it's up for uh, our congregation and i think the rationale many congregations although their congregation might have been split um voted all of their delegates in favor because that was the majority, whether it was 51% or 99%, were in favor. And so they felt, well, that's, that's how we want our whole congregation to be heard. But I would think it would be safer to have a situation where there are written guidelines as opposed to people following their conscience, because there's different well, interpretations of how one follows one's conscience, especially in light of all the crazy things that have, are happening in the world. <laughs> yeah, well, that, that will be a discussion at a board meeting. Uh, we got as far as voting on criteria, which I hope Galen will bring up now. Uh, criteria for individual delegates, what everybody who's appointed as a delegate needs to uh, do or be. And then also criteria for the team, because we felt that of six val uh, uh, delegates, we don't want to have all of them the same gender, the same race, the same age, etc. So let me just go over that now. There it is, and it's in your handout if you're in the sanctuary. <clears throat> So we decided that um, to be a delegate, you had to be a member for at least six months, and that's the same criteria to be on the board. Um, <clears throat> we want to make sure that people have had some recent active involvement in at least one team, committee, or task force, preferably, but not necessarily in a leadership role. So they've been a member for at least six months, and they're actively involved and some demonstrated interest and knowledge of CUC, whether that's attending CUC gatherings, workshops, roundtables, or webinars. There's lots of programs that come out through CUC. And then um, <clears throat> good written and verbal communication skills, preferably co uh, comfort with public speaking, because under this new model of two years, we're asking the delegates to then bring back information from the CUC and engage with the congregation about that. And then the last one is comfort and access to a computer, webcam, and online communication programs. Because for the foreseeable future, we're likely to have most, if not all, of our delegates attending by Zoom. So everybody is, would be asked to comment on that when they express interest in being a delegate. And then the uh, criteria for the team, a range of newer members with more experienced members. So one or more members might have barely been a member for six months, and that's cool. And others might be like Leslie and Galen and Olivia have attended six or more AGMs in the past. Um, we want to provide opportunities for first-time delegates, but with support from each other and the previous delegates. So just as an aside, this year our six delegates were connected on a WhatsApp conversation during the meeting. So we want to encourage that kind of communication among the, among the delegates. And then a diversity of age, gender, heritage, length of time as a member, and areas of involvement. So there was some uh, uh, discussion about 
would we put kind of a, a quota, a number on that? Like we need two of this and one of that, et cetera, and decided not to do that, but to look at the expressions of interest we get. And if there's more than six expressions of interest, look among that and see what we can do. Um, and so we need at least two of those overall six to be experienced at setting up online or in-person in forums to discuss the issues. So not all six need to be able to do that, but we want to make sure at least two can form a team and facilitate those discussions. And at least two, the same two or a different two, who are willing and able to write web articles and e-newsletters about the issues three times a year. So um, any questions or comments on the criteria we've set? Uh, I, actually, I actually want to make a comment on the issue we were talking a moment about in terms of how, how delegates vote. Mm. Do you want me to hold off on that? No, go ahead. Until, um, because what I found, so when, when delegates are actually there at a meeting, there might be, there's something on the agenda and, and it hasn't been decided yet and people stand up. Um, it used to be like on either side of the room, there'd be a microphone for those in favor of the motion, a microphone over here for those not in favor of the motion. And people turn by turn would speak to why they were in favor or not in favor. And as you sit there and listen and consider, you might change a viewpoint. So when you're there in person, you, you're there representing your congregation, you know um, your congregation, but you're also open to hearing different viewpoints. And, and I like that kind of system. I was surprised. So this year, quite a few congregations uh, took, uh, you know, had discussion at home in their congregation, you know, took their vote on whether they were in favor or not in favor of passing that principle, and then told their delegates how to vote. So what was the point of going to the meeting? They could just put their votes in electronically from home. And maybe that's a system we'll go to in the future. I don't know. Um, but I found tremendous value in having an opportunity to actually sit and listen and witness different points of view that often led to a very, you know, a very, a very clear vote for me as a delegate. So thanks for that. And back to Sheila. I appreciate what, what you just said, Lynn, and I, 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 I can see the reality of the situation, but I can't help but think that if I was one of the members at UCV and we had been part of a forum with lots of pros and cons and heated discussions and we finally come to some sort of an agreement that someone else, you or someone else, can then go to the AGM and then, and then, like disregard or ignore the decision of of the UCV members. I know that as a UCV member, I would be extremely annoyed by that. And sort of question: Well, what's the point of having okay. this, having had this big long discussion and debate if the delegate can just can go and just change his or her mind? Yeah you know, based on, you know, what they've just heard. Yeah, let, let me respond to that. Okay. I, I mean, first of all, rarely does something so significant come up that the delegates are likely to change how they felt from the beginning. They get more deeply informed, and as Leslie commented, they might be more inspired to bring back a call to action to their congregation from hearing all of the uh, discussion. Um, so last year was an anomaly in the history of the CUC, right? Where in the May meeting, somebody proposed something from the floor, it was voted on, and then checked the bylaws and went, oh no, we, we weren't allowed to do that. And so the compromise was uh, bringing a, a, a meeting in November rather than waiting till the following May. And, and a friend of mine from a smaller congregation was one of the delegates, 
and she, you know, she's a very ethical, responsible person, um, but had to vote on, there were two motions, I think one, one was uh, kind of whether to proceed, and then the second one was voting on the motion. And so she voted opposed to proceeding on it, but when it went ahead, she voted in favor. And when she got back to the congregation, Sheila, someone like you said, how dare you, <laughs> you know, vote on that? And she said, well, this, is, this was my thinking. You know, I did the best I could with what I felt our congregation had previously said and how they would have responded if they were all there, but they weren't there. So did the best I could. So uh, somebody, Winston Churchill or somebody said, democracy is not perfect but possibly it's the best we've got at this moment. Maybe, maybe we'll come up with something better soon. Uh, Mary, we have a, a, another comment or question from Zoom. Great. Well, yeah, it's just on the same thing. And I, I think there is, like in, in some respects, I agree with Lynn. I don't know about directing delegates, but I think you choose, let's say of 80% or a certain number of the congregation have strong views, you probably do choose delegates based on that. But if we had six, maybe it's appropriate to have one delegate who has an, another view because the rights, you know, democracy isn't just about the minority. I mean, majority, it's about the rights of minorities to be represented. So, but I, I think it's different from saying you have to vote this way, but it's maybe part of the, the choosing process of delegates. If you had debates before and people say, this is where I'm at with this issue, you maybe select delegates, but you don't, they still could change their mind, you know, cause there is that right of conscience. So I think there's, it's not quite so cut and dried as saying you have to vote this way, but it's, you know, I think it. I think it does make sense in a democracy to choose people who represent you, who represent both. You know, the broad range of views within a congregation. Okay. Well, I think I'll just end by echoing uh, Lynn's pitch of consider serving as a delegate. Minimum four hours online for the meeting, but get more informed and involved in the CUC. And we've got a link to a, a Google form, ucv.im slash CUC application, all one word, and we'll be, we'll be circulating that more. We've asked uh, people to apply by March the 11th so that we can make a decision by March 15th at our March 15th meeting and um, we have to submit the uh, names to CUC by April the 1st. So thank you for coming, participating in the discussion as well as the technology test. By the way, I love those guidelines that you've come up with so far, I meant to mention that. that oh, thank great. you, Leslie. Yeah, uh, I think they're very good. I liked what all of our people here today had to say. I, you know, we've always had trouble getting people available and it was uh, today, again, many of the same people who have been involved before and not that many new people. So I hope we can continue to get new people involved. Okay. Well, thank you all three on there and Galen as our stalwart tech support. Galen does the tech support for our board meetings as well, which is a fabulous gift to Lynn and me who otherwise would be fussing with technology while we're trying to do our other jobs. And the wonders of the World Wide Web, there he is up in Nelson, still volunteering after all these years. <laughs> Thanks all. Bye.